Um, coming back to what I said in my previous talk, I've got, I've got the bit that no one wants to talk about now. Going into residential care and death. Um, sadly, that is an inevitability for all of us. Um, and, and one of my colleagues who teaches end of life and dementia training with me is in the room here. And we do get some very shocked responses when one of the first things we tell people on the day is you do realise that it's going to happen to you one day as well. And everyone goes, oh. <coughs> because I, I haven't got the key to immortality yet. So um, and when I do, I'll have it for myself first. Thank you very much. But it's a, it's a subject that we seem to skirt around an awful lot. The two issues of residential care and death. But they're the things that actually can be such a difference to someone with dementia or their family if they're able to have the conversations earlier. So you can see there's a link here. If we go back to the support that I was talking about earlier, if we get the right support at the right time to enable us to have the right conversations, how empowering will that be for the person with dementia and their family? Anyone want to think about shout out a few things about what when you think someone might be going into residential care any thoughts no so, so mobility and care needs yeah for the road safety yeah safety sorry cliff and if you've got any family left? Absolutely, if you're on your own. Dare I say, following Archie's in incontinence? Yeah. Okay. The elephant in the room. Going back to Lisa again, behaviour, perhaps? Okay. So we've got a few things there. Now, I could go through that list now. And um, e even with your answer, Cliff, I could probably look at ways that we could manage these without having the need for residential care. Now, I'm not suggesting that is the case on every occasion, but what often happens is family carers and people with dementia are not prepared, do not have those preparatory conversations, so don't know how to minimise some of these risks until it gets to crisis point. For many families, the choice of residential care often comes at a point where someone's had an emergency admission to a hospital, when there is a sudden acute crisis, either the person with dementia or the carer has become unwell and is unable to cope for a period of time. And obviously there's been a lot of evidence and sharing of evidence around the fact that if someone with dementia goes into a hospital or a care home, it's very hard to bring back their independence once they're discharged. So what, say for example, what a scenario I've had recently is a gentleman who did have incontinence issues, who was so frightened and upset by them, he was very, very conscious of them, he hardly ate or drank. And the reason he didn't eat and drink was because actually if he didn't drink too much then he didn't need to go to the toilet very often and if he did have an accident it wouldn't happen so much because there wouldn't be so much production of urine. So what consequently happened there was his wife thought, oh, this is great. He's, he's, not, he's not having too many wet pads, so he's obviously more continent. She's not aware of the fact that he's not drinking enough. She just thinks he's managing his continence better. That gentleman got a very severe UTI, a urinary tract in, in, information, infection even. As a result of that, he then um, had some delirium which is when people with an infection become very acutely confused um, and very unwell, so some hallucinate, some don't know something. But of course, he'd already got a diagnosis of dementia, so what did everyone think? That was his dementia, the symptom of his dementia. So it kind of flew under the radar for a few days, while this urine infection is getting subsequently worse and worse and worse and worse, to the point that he had to go into hospital. Now, he was aggressive, when he got into hospital, but not because of his dementia. This man had a delirium. He'd also been taken from his home into an environment that was alien to him. His communication skills verbally were not great. Because he was on his own, his wife wasn't there to advocate for him and converse with him. And so his behavior was misconstrued, his needs were not met, and he, he appeared a problem patient. 
And at no point did hospital staff engage with the family particularly well. So what happens here is his behaviour is deemed so difficult that he's not going to be able to go back home once the urinary tract infection is resolved. And actually delirium can go on for weeks, sometimes months, even after the actual infection itself ha has resolved. So this gentleman ended up in, in a care home. Now, how many times could we have avoided that? Very many times. And I'd say we could go right back to the point of actually talking about continence and incontinence and saying, actually, you need to maintain your, your well-being by drinking plenty, explaining to the wife the importance of that, making sure there's been a proper continence referral done so they have the correct equipment to deal with the continence issues, talking through some of the early warning signs of what is acceptable with an infection, um, what sort of symptoms you'd be looking for, you know, explaining to people that that wouldn't be a normal presentation in that dementia. So we might have even stopped this poor man going into hospital in the first place. So actually, when we ask why, when is the right time to go into to care, should we not be taking a step forward and saying, a step backwards rather, and teaching people what to look out for to prevent that happening? Because again, we could then look at another issue about being on your own, Cliff. You brought up that, didn't you? If we recognise that someone doesn't have friends or family locally, there are opportunities that we have to support that person in their own environment, perhaps local groups, perhaps sheltered housing, lots of things that could then mean that that person is well supported without a family in the true sense of the word. And I'd argue family is a bit of a loose term anyway. Often people are befriended by their social um, um, friends, by their work colleagues, by you know, their community. So actually you don't necessarily have to choose your family. And actually lots of people don't choose their family. Um, <laughs> they'd rather have their friends and, and, and acquaintances around them. So we can actually start to build uh, a, a safety net around someone to prevent that becoming a risk later on. Because if we start to look at all these components, most of those on their own would not lead to someone going into residential care unless there was not the right support and provision to actually accommodate it in the first place. And, but saying that, there is never a right or wrong answer in this, which is why it's so important to have the conversations early on. So when someone's diagnosed with dementia, one doesn't expect to have some of the most difficult conversations straight away post-diagnosis. But actually, if you've got someone that you can call upon at peer, different periods and different stages throughout the condition, if you have got a query or a doubt or you're having conversations and people pick up on those cues and clues of the conversation, they can start to be think, preparing you to think about those things. Because don't we all do that? We all sort of think, well, what if? What if this happens? What would I do? But if we don't support you with the what ifs, how can you think about what those conclusions might be later on? So a part of our role is, again, talking to families, talking to people with dementia, saying, you know, go and have a look at a care home, because care homes frighten people. The, fit, the thought of a care home frightens people. Carers feel incredibly guilty. But it depends what your perception of a care home is and what the reality of that might be very different. Now, I'm not going to stand here and say that all care homes are wonderful, but I'm neither going to say all care homes are bad, because there's variability across the board. But actually, for many of, of an older generation, when I speak to them, they see a care home as the old St Andrews Hospital. Well, I don't know if you're local, the old St Andrews Hospital used to be our asylum, for a better word. So people think that once you get dementia and you struggle with some of the symptoms, that you end up in an asylum. So I can understand why people have a sudden fear of what might be around the corner because actually they've not broken those barriers down. They've not gone and had a look in a care home to see what it might look like. They might not, and there might be some real benefits for some people to go into care, particularly if they are incredibly lonely and they are feeling that they need the support and supervision of others around them. But without those conversations in broaching it, it's very difficult to think about, which is why advanced care planning is so very, very important. I would argue that anyone in this room should think about doing an advanced care plan, whether you have dementia or not, whether you have a fear of dementia or not, because at any, at any point, any one of us could be in a situation where we may not be able to communicate effectively, we might be rushed into hospital, there might be some really important things that we would want people to know about us. 
going back to my own situation, my mum had motor neurone disease, so she couldn't communicate from a very early stage. So for her, it was vital that she had a tool that meant she could speak or at least get her views known earlier on, which is why I already have an advanced care plan, because there are simple th things that I would want people to know if anything were to happen to me. Now, going back to my hydration, don't ever put a cup of tea with two sugars in front of me, because I will become aggressive. I will spit it out at you, and I will be seen as that challenging patient. I only ever drink coffee. Now, that may seem like a very, very simple thing, but if that's something that's really important to you, those are the key little things you can put in a This Is Me document or an advanced care plan. Or if you have a view that, actually, I've been and had a look at some of these care homes, and I really didn't like that one down there, but I tell you what, if you ever have to put me in one, that's where I'd like to go. Because for the families, that's incredibly useful, because how difficult is it to make decisions on someone else's behalf when you don't know what their wishes are? I think it's incredibly difficult. And the last in power of attorneys. And again, we, uh, we kind of allude to these kind of things when we first have people diagnosed, but because they don't necessarily have the post-diagnostic support, they may lose the opportunity to have all these things that are really empowering to have. Um, Cliff, can I ask you, if, have you, have, have you done one? How was it for you doing one? Was it, was it a positive thing? A bit difficult. Mm. Uh, I was fancy. Yeah. But is it nice to have that in place? Do you yes. Yeah. And aren't no, you similarly? No, do you yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I think you know, it's it's really positive that you two have been given the opportunity because sadly we see an awful lot of people that have never ever been given the opportunity to get those things down on paper. Um, and I think who was it said something earlier? I don't want my husband to be my power of attorney for medical reasons. I'd much rather be my daughter. And it's not because I don't value my husband, but I think given in a crisis, he'd be absolutely awful. My daughter's a little bit more level-headed, and I think actually, although we have, you know, it'd be a, a difficult thing for her to do, I'm quite sure that she would be the better person. But when we're talking about relationships and things like that, we make assumptions about those relationships when someone with dementia who might not be able to communicate comes into hospital. And I would like, to, I would like the hospital to know that I don't want it to be my husband, I want it to be my daughter, but if I've not been given the opportunity to start these conversations and document them, my wishes and thoughts may never be considered. So I think, going back to what we said about residential care, there is no right and wrong answer. Carers often ask me, when will I know? And the answer is, you may never know, you may never happen, because actually, people with dementia have different symptoms, they have different behaviours, they have different progressions, and it isn't going to be the same, so we can never answer those questions. And actually, so people's previous experience, life experiences, their ability to cope is very, very different, so not everyone's going to make the same decisions. So there is no right and wrong. But you can see where the guilt would be reduced if you've had those discussions earlier on. So if nothing else, go to your GP surgery and ask them for a yellow folder. Because the yellow folder is a new thinking ahead document which has the advanced care plan in it. And everybody can use one of those. You don't have to have dementia. You can just fill that in. But coming to the end of life decision, some people with dementia actually have poor access to good quality end of life care. Um, where more people with other conditions might be able to die at home, a lot of people with dementia end up in hospital or in care um, to pass away. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but often that's because they haven't been given the choices. Um, they haven't written all these things down to stop them becoming uh, an admission in the first place. And when they do get there, th their outcomes are not so positive. So again, we need to look at how we support people with dementia at end of life. Now, if we've got 850,000 people in the UK who have dementia, 850,000 people with dementia are going to need end of life care at some point, regardless of what their situation is and what happens at that end of life. So we need to change that completely and give people more ownership. If I have cancer, and I can still talk, and my communication is not impaired, I will be able to have much more input into my end-of-life choices and decisions. If I have dementia, maybe, and my communication's not as good, 
without all the documentation and the conversations leading up to that point, I'm not going to be able to express my wishes. And I don't think that's where we should be. We should be looking towards improving that scenario. Um, I'll give you a, a, as, as a last part, because I appreciate this is quite a heavy subject and you might have some questions around it. Um, I'll give you a case example of how things can go right even later on. I was at carers group and a lady came up to me and I'd never met her before and she said, oh, I'm so glad you're here. I've heard all about you. I know you'll be able to help me about my car. Okay, your car. What do I need to help you with about your car? I'm the most least technically minded person you'll ever know, trust me. Um, I need to get the seats moved out, my woman, because I can't get my husband in and out. So, husband's six foot three, she's nay high. Husband's got um, a, quite a complicated dementia. There's two or three components to it, but it affects his mobility quite significantly. Lots of other health problems. I took one look at him and thought, he doesn't look well. And I took one look at her and thought, she looks exhausted. The last thing she needs to worry about is a blooming car. So anyway, we had a real conversation about and unpicked what was going on. She was providing full care to husband, washing, dressing, everything, running the home on her own with no package of care at all. So I said, look, you're not in my area, but I'm coming to see you tomorrow because this can't continue. So I popped out the following day and he actually looked even more unwell the following day. So we got the GP involved who agreed we suspected this man had a malignancy that actually was likely to, to end his life within the next few weeks, couple of months. We had a conversation with him and she went, and I'm going to swear, oh, that's bloody marvellous that is. I knew that was happening, but no one would talk to me about it. So we got to the point of actually, well, what do you want to happen? Because this isn't going to be easy for you. So she said, but I want him at home. He's always wanted to be home. Can we make it happen? So we managed to get the hospital bed in, and they had a beautiful big lounge, so we had a hospital bed. This was just before Christmas. We had all the medication in the house, so should he take poorly over Christmas, it was available to him. And we got a package of caring. He'd been seen by the continence team, been seen by occupational therapy, so everything was there to keep him at home. We'd advise the GP surgery in the out of hours that if anything happened, he was to stay at home because that's where he chose to be. Blow me, he did had a lovely Christmas. He sat there in the middle of his lounge, all his family around him, he would participate in it fully. He then continued to do quite well until about March. So he proved me wrong on several occasions. But by this time he was completely immobile, he wasn't even full care, but he was still surrounded by the love of his family in the place he wanted to be. I went round to his house two days before his birthday. And it was very clear to me that he wasn't going to make his birthday. And it was very clear to his wife that he wasn't going to make his birthday. So we opened his birthday cards up. And one of them included a letter, beautiful letter written from his sister who lived away. And it talked about their childhood and their memories. And she, you know, she was more or less saying goodbye in her own way to him. So we read that to him. And I got a phone call later that evening to say he passed away. Now, the story doesn't end there. Because this lady was so pleased that the outcome had been as they both wished. He'd been at home, he'd been well supported, the family all around him. But she was a bit concerned that he'd missed out on his birthday. So they went down to the undertakers on the Saturday morning, which was his birthday, and sang him happy birthday. And took him some balloons. Now that lady is now a volunteer with one of our groups. She actually said she felt empowered because he'd had several admissions before we got in touch with each other, you know, where it was completely taken out of her hands. She said she doesn't feel that she's had to grieve because she's grieved throughout his illness and actually the outcome at the end was the perfect death, in her words, with the perfect outcome. Now, I think that's not too difficult and I think that's something we should be aiming to achieve for as many people as we possibly can. So that's not what everybody will want. Everybody wants something different. I want to be in Glastonbury, um, preferably at the point when the festival's ongoing, um, <laughs> with rather large amounts of alcohol on me. But if nobody knows that, if nobody has those conversations, how can we make a difference and make it happen? So on that note, I'm going to stop.
and allow you to ask any questions if you'd like. If it's touched a nerve with anyone and made anyone feel a little bit uncomfortable, please do come and speak to me afterwards because I'm more than happy to have a conversation with you because I appreciate it's a difficult subject. Okay, any Absolutely. Absolutely. They are very welcome Absolutely. They don't need to be, you know, places that are just no. end of life or tours when you're not able to. You can do it when you are able. Absolutely. See what it feels like. There's one near you and you think you might be we need to break that taboo down, don't we? We need to get people engaged because actually there is nothing wrong with being in a care home. It's, it's not a, this is never going to be a right or a wrong decision, a right or wrong answer. But certainly, you know, a lot of the care homes now are doing carers groups and, and you know, things like that. So it's a really good opportunity to just dip your toe in the water and have a little look. Same with daycare. Everyone's got this vision of daycare that, you know, is not particularly healthy. So go and tip your toe in the water when they've got the carers group next door and have a little look and break down some of the taboos around it. Anyone else? I was just thinking about when we talk about the end of care as well. I think I have a lot of questions that people often think that they, once their relative has gone into residential care, yeah. they're almost like they're in prison, you know, they can't take them out. That's it, that's the final bit, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. You know, and I say, no, no, of course not. You know, if you can go out every day if, if, if that suits or whatever. Yeah. So I think it's really important and it can be a really positive thing exactly because yeah. I mean we've had a lady who who um, the lady with the hemorrhoids actually God bless her when she did finally go in it was the point for her to, to actually have her husband in care and and they have a wonderful relationship now because their relationship was incredibly difficult when they were at home. I've never seen two people more affectionate towards each other and it was actually heartbreaking to watch because the relationship was all or nothing, if that makes sense. His behaviour was incredibly difficult to live with, not because he was aggressive or violent, but he was very, um, need, he needed to be in her vision all, all the time. So she was very, very constrained by his presence. Um, and he went into care, and we managed to find a care home which was on the bus route from her home. So she's only got a 10 minute bus journey. Um, we did have to batten a little bit for that one because the, the place he should have gone was sort of 10 miles away. So we were, but I knew that this relationship was really, really important to both of them. And she visits him every day. Um, she gets a the bus there at nine o'clock in the morning. She stays there till one o'clock. They go down, out for a latte, because they always fancied a latte. Um, she goes on all the trips um, that they arrange at the residential home and he comes home and goes to, off to the, the grandchildren's periodically for a night stay because actually she, they've got the best of both worlds there. She hasn't got that emotional strain and distress all the time but she still retained that relationship. And there's a lot of families who put their loved ones into care and then about three months down and I go, oh, I didn't realise I could take them out. Yes. You, know? <laughs> you know, the relationship doesn't stop. So the, hence there is no right or wrong way. It's, it's whatever meets the needs of, of the person with dementia and the family. And that will vary considerably for everybody. So you get that in the other relationship as well. Absolutely. It? If it's, oh, I, I now feel like a daughter again, or I now feel like a wife again. Absolutely. The person is doing all the care. Yeah. So you, you can gain something. I met a couple, um, that was earlier in the week, I was at a conference, and it was really, really refreshing because they've already written down the care homes that they want to go, they've told their children, they said, we don't want to be a burden, this is where we want to go, but be warned, we're going to blow all our money um, on our care home fees and nice holidays, so you're not going to get anything, but that's our choice. We don't want you to try and keep us at home, we want you to put us into care. And I think, good on them, but because we, we aren't, talking about it enough, not enough people are being able to make those opportunities and have those conversations and make those decisions for themselves. As long as it serves alcohol, I'll go there. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie Ann knows that it, it, you know, it's, well, when, we, when we teach, there tends to be a theme about alcohol, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So as long as it serves... 
Yes, but you're, you're very good. <laughs> Sandra is not so great. Me and Sandra always talk about the fact we want to... If, if we ever get swallowing problems, we'd like a nice cold gin and tonic, thank you very much, and suddenly it might improve the matter. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Oh, yes? Do you come across people, people where they're in, they go into residential care for something between, say, the five weeks respite and full time? Mm. Is there anything... I've got Between that, you know? there's patients we have, and, it, and I think this is where you have to be really careful in what's in the best, whose best interests is that in? You have to mm. think about is it in the best interest of the carer or is it the best interest of the person with dementia? I have got one gentleman who spends four days a week in care and three days at home, and he's been doing that for some, a long time. We're actually now looking at him probably making the full transition into care because he's finding it incredibly difficult to adapt from going home to the care home constantly. Um, he actually went in because of physical problems more than his dementia. So it wasn't an issue to start with, but now that his dementia has declined somewhat, it is becoming more problematic for him and, and actually distressing him. Um, he actually copes better in the care home now than he does at home. And we're not quite sure why. We think it's because he feels less challenged and less threatened in the residential care because he, he's, the expectation is very different. Because going back to what Lisa said earlier, that you know there's, there's paid caregivers in there instead of a, a relationship and an emotional attachment to someone who's providing care. So that there are ways you can do it, um, but it has, to, it has to meet the needs of both parties, but it has to be in the best interest of the person who might not be able to consent to it. Because if we start doing sort of tweaking things in a way that benefits the carer, but not that person, it's, it's kind of a difficult yeah. scenario. I can see that it, would, it might easily become obvious that they thought actually it should be there. Mm. But but it yeah. doesn't mean it should be ruled out yeah. because I think, you know, and, and actually for some people who are transitioning into care, um, it does make it easier for them, particularly for the carers. So if the person responds positively, it's certainly an option that could be explored, but sometimes that constant changing may not be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Right. I think we've explored that one. Hopefully we've got something a little bit more, can we liven you up a little bit? Because that's a really hard subject to, to kind of finish on. So, Lisa, you've got to have a pearl of wisdom to liven someone up oh, with. Oh, no, no, no. Let's put you on the spot. spot. Yes, yes. <laughs>